B Renegade Productions, in association with Wild Wind Studios, presents I Am Human, written and narrated by Anastasia Blackwell. Episode 3. Liberty's Odyssey does not end in the dawn of the new year. In early 2025, she exists in survival mode. Her days are like an ant's journey from plain to mound. Each one is a struggle to rise, carry on, and engage with the world. The world itself is a challenging and for some terrifying place in 2025. The political stage grows more dramatic and corrupt, endangered by global warming and nuclear threats, while epidemics and technology threaten the fate of mankind. It is a dark night of the soul, and she can discover no remedy to treat her malaise. Her phone rings and she resists answering, but sees Josie and Dre are on visual dial, and she opens her computer. Good evening, Lib. What are you doing, love? There's a screening tonight at the Film Directors Guild. It's a great networking op, and it's rumored the Hemsworths are going to be there. Please, will you join us? Thanks, girls, but I have to pass. Lib, cut the hermit shit. You've become a mole ever since you last saw Ray. It's not about him. I just need time to process the turmoil of the last decade. Are you still going through all those photo albums? Throw that shit away, Lib. It'll only make you feel worse. I'm cleaning out the old to prepare for new energy. Bullshit. Get your ass over here, girl. But I have some good news. The university granted Braden an opportunity to study abroad in Argentina. I'm making plans to visit him later this year. Great. I hear the men are red hot. If you're into Italian-Spanish machismo, Add stray. And I can write off the expenses since I'll be combing the streets in search of treasures. Great, but toss out those old photos of your life in the burbs and get your ass over here or we're coming over to kidnap you. Later that year, on her flight to Argentina, Liberty records in her journal, This is a true story, straight from the heart. My tale will not be lost to history. She arrives with fresh optimism in Buenos Aires. It is an exquisite adventure and she feels alive with the possibility of resurrection. One evening, a Alone on the streets, Liberty stumbles upon a political demonstration. The vigor of the congregated masses charges the air with intoxicating thrill. The throng take her deep into their folds, and she moves with the undertow to face an imposing judicial building. Beneath the colorful flags of demonstrators in the tribunal, voices elevated by a speaker denounce unspeakable acts of negligence and violence by their government. A man positions himself next to Liberty. Tall, well-built, dressed in a pea coat and jeans, with with golden skin and lush dark hair spilling to his collar, topped by a fedora displaying a gold crescent pin. He has warm brown eyes and a smile that reveals teeth glimmering white beneath the bloated moon. Are you an American? He asks. Is it obvious? She answers and returns his smile. I am trained to look out for strangers in political rallies. My name is Timberlane Rivera. What brings you to our city? I'm visiting my son who's studying abroad and I'm in the fashion business, so I'm on a buying trip. I didn't purchase a return ticket, but I'm not a terrorist. <laughs> Do the people gather here often? Every Thursday, the women here you see wearing white scarves hold signs with names of children and grandchildren lost during the 1970s in the dirty war. We cannot allow government institutions to rule us through fear. They are here to serve us, not the other way around. So we meet here as a reminder we will not give up. Every person may voice their grievance. An injustice to one citizen is a blow to us all. Flags wave and patriotic music stirs the crowd to a near riot. In America, the Constitution is supposed to be democratic but founding fathers forged the document, not mothers. So women's voices have been squelched over the centuries. Your founders fought a battle as bastard children against a streaked and unyielding father across the Atlantic. Now they have grown into the role of the overbearing father. You can accept rules or create your own. There are many ways to revolt and achieve goals. He offers a charming smile. Are you a revolutionary? I am a transformation. I'm not familiar with the ideology. The crowd roars, cannons fire, and a zealous chaotic energy infuses the square. The protest is about to break up. Would you allow me the pleasure of buying you a drink? In the past, Liberty would have rejected his offer. Even now she weighs the danger. But nature intervenes and they are caught in a rainstorm. 
Tamerlane removes his overcoat and uses it to shield her from the torrential downpour. I have a favorite place. Americans frequent. I'll get you a cab home later. He guides her to a lovely restaurant near the Ricoleta Cemetery. The restaurant manager greets Tamerlane as an old friend. He offers a prime window table with a view of the entrance to the cemetery and pedestrians passing beneath colorful umbrellas. The chatter of guests and the soothing sound of rain against the rooftop afford a homey intimacy. I followed the family tradition and went to law school. I come from a long line of attorneys and politicians, but when I experienced firsthand the corruption in the government and courts, I was disgusted that there is no justice for the underprivileged in this land or any other. Institutions are created to earn capital, create fear, and control the masses. He pauses and looks out the window, streaming with rain, then turns to her. Tonight, as we face the tribe Tribunal. I saw in your eyes you had suffered an institutional injustice. Yes, I believe I have, in the family law division of the judicial courts. But I would rather hear you speak. I wish to begin the next quarter century with fresh perspective. Sometimes the courts will dole out a good result, often published in the media. It, it operates in the manner of a lottery or a slot machine, giving people hope and reinforcement that the system works to their benefit. But even then, the attorneys are the real winners. Do you still practice law? I occasionally take cases to assist those who do not have access to a defense, but mostly my efforts are centered on working with activists to create an underground social movement that operates both inside the system. Our beliefs are rooted in the sovereignty of the individual. Is that the role of a transformationalist? I suppose. So tell me, beautiful, beautiful liberty, what led you there? I asked the ticket taker what stop to take to arrive at Arnales and Supicha. <laughs> I don't, I can't pronounce the words right. He told me to get off at the, um, the tribunal's exit. Then it was fate. How so? You got off at the wrong stop. A waiter who moves like an invisible puppeteer guides him by the strings, arrives with a silver platter of steaming coffee. Tamerlane switches to his native Spanish tongue. Liberty peers through the pouring rain beating against the window. The world dissolves into a blur, leaving only the sanctity of the moment. Is your family buried there? She asks him and peers out the rain-smeared window toward the gates of the cemetery. Yes, they lie next to the murderous general. She shifts her gaze to a painting on the panel wall of a beautiful couple dancing. The raven-haired beauty wears a low-cut dress, slit to thigh, and a shapely leg wrapped around her partner. They appear either drunk on love or Malbec, and the infatuation is tantalizing. Have you danced the tango? His eyes are penetrating. I have, a few times in the past. <laughs> it's a challenge for me to give over control to the man, she answers, and then cuts into a dessert oozing with warm caramel and chocolate. He flashes a charm smile. There is an underground club where the greatest tango performers in the world practice for championships. If you like, I would take you there. Do you dance? Uh, I used to compete when I was a student at the university. Now I enjoy it for recreation. In that case, perhaps you can recommend a studio for me to study a few basic steps before you introduce me to the dance floor. I know the perfect place. I would start with the female instructor before her husband takes over, he says and reaches for the bell. I'll call you a car. Later, Liberty writes in her journal, The protest was exhilarating, yet I want more. I yearn to be rocked to the soul by a passion I can't control, taken to the furthest edge of body and mind by an obsessive, unquenchable desire that burns through midnight, blazes shadows against stars, and brings new meaning to a world gone stale. Tamerlane made me comfortable in a way that suggests eminent intimacy. I'm uncertain where this might lead. It's frightening to abandon and explore lust with this foreigner. I haven't been with a man since the divorce, but I am ready to step into the 
unknown. Sometimes people are guideposts stationed by destiny to introduce you to the next phase of your journey as agents of transformation. Occasionally, a stranger emerges to offer a passionate night, a dance with danger, when traveling abroad from the homeland. If one is fortunate, the two collide. Stay quiet and don't ask questions, Mom, orders her son, Brayden. He's a tall, handsome young man with wavy blonde hair, vivid gray eyes, and wears a fashionable sport coat, shirt, and pants. Liberty is attired in colorful tights and tunic with trench cover and suede boots cinched at the knee. Her hair has grown long and the gilded strands flow on the night breeze. They enter an old-fashioned phone booth. He closes the door behind them and retrieves a note with the secret number, then dials it into the phone. Flashing lights and throbbing music accompany lights out. Ready, set, go! The booth drops two floors to deposit them at the entrance of a private club. It's modeled after an old speakeasy from a century ago, when people had to hide out to get served booze. The drinking age is 18 here, so I'm legal. And Mom, please don't embarrass me by talking about my childhood. The club is dark, elegant, with an atmosphere of a cinema noir gangster hangout. Braden saddles up to the bar and orders drinks. Ever had a sidecar, Mom? No. Cognac, orange liqueur, and lemon juice shaken with ice and served with sugar rim. Mmm, delicious. I didn't know you were such an expert. Liberty turns to where three arrogant men stride into the room, dressed in a manner that suggests wealth, status, and high testosterone. The Argentinian men are such douches. They're Zoolanders with all the poses. Women drool over the fancy suits, money clips, and greasy hair. It must take those dudes hours to prep. I don't have a chance in this joint. My friends and I usually hang at the local places where students gather, but I wanted to give you an op to see the pigs at play. I'll have another, he tells the bartender. It will be difficult to go back to being underage. No worries, Mom. I've had fake ID since I was 13. Glad you waited to tell me until now. Hola, preciosa, declares a Zoolander. He approaches Liberty and offers a hand adorned with a gold chain, bracelet, and ring. Hey, man, I'm trying to figure a way to get a carload of coke over the border. You got any ideas? I know you speak English, so let's transact in the language. I know a route. to have a fast car for the right price. Who is your benefactor? The woman you're talking to, but she also works under cover, so I'd find another target unless you want to end up servicing a prison warden. With a flare of his nostrils and haughty head toss, the Zoolander strides off to scope his next victim. What was that all about? Mom, you've got to learn how to keep the creeps off your turf, Braden says and scans the joint. I'm hungry. Let's get some dinner. They find an empty banquet and proceed to consume stacks of seared steak and sausage, boiled potatoes, sautéed greens, buttered garlic twists, and a decadent chocolate dessert laced with caramel and topped with vanilla bean ice cream, along with a bottle of Malbec. She looks to a neighboring table. I don't understand how these people eat so much food. Those two have consumed enough for a family of four. The people here have huge appetites and are proud of their curves. Skinny means poor in this country. Later, they depart the phone booth and walk onto the sidewalk to hail an electric cab. A man emerges out of the shadows, grabs Liberty around the waist, and draws her close, then snatches at her purse. Braden grabs his mother by the arm and barks, Hands off, fucker! He drags Liberty into the middle of the street where he stops traffic to hail a ride. Braden, for God's sake! An automatic car screeches to a halt and they jump inside. Mom, you need to be careful. It's not like in the States here. It can be dangerous. Watch your back at all times. People here are desperate. There is wealth and poverty, nothing in between. And you need to tone down the posh look. Your hair and clothes are like a flag waving for attention. I never imagined you would take over the parental role. Thanks spray, but you need to do the same, darling. Please be safe. She draws him close. I know Dad's been an asshole, Mom. Raken and I will always support and take care of you. Focus on your future, darling, and how you might help to change the world, Liberty says, and looks outside the window into a squalid urban landscape. She meets Tamerlane the following afternoon for a tour of the cemetery. I grew up in the barrio of Recoleta, on the street that houses many of the embassies. The people who live in the district control Argentina's wealth. He guides her past a vendor cooking glazed walnuts through neoclassical gates and Doric columns into one of the most famous cemeteries in the world. Inside the walled gates is a city of extravagant mausoleums that house the remains of wealthy, famous, and infamous Argentinian citizens.
Most locals born in the neighborhood spend their entire lives here. They are born, baptized in the church, educated, build careers, get married, raise children, retire, and move to the exclusive city of the dead. It is expensive real estate, and there are no simple stones like the kind used to mark the remains of common people. No exit, I'm sorry. Oh, your description reminds me of an existential play by Jean-Paul Sartre. She turns to admire the vast array of artistry used to depict the essence of human life in stone. The elaborate mausoleums have a wide range of architectural style and are attached like miniature houses decorated with sculptures, art, and photographs. The resting ground is tranquilly disturbing, gothically beautiful a place of opulent splendor, and a facade for darker stories, a ghost town in the literal sense. There is a strong French influence, but pyramids, Egyptian motifs, and masonry symbols add an an eclectic flair. Laid out like city blocks, they line the main walkways with trees leading to narrow streets, meandering for blocks. There are thousands of homes for the deceased, and many offer views inside doors and windows of elaborate wood caskets adorned with precious metals. This young woman was mistakenly entombed alive and died of fright when she awakened. They reburied her behind glass in case she reawakens a second time. The poor dear. That's heartbreaking. They buried Eva Perone down this walkway. He leads her along a path to an elegant crypt lined with flowers and notes from fans. A slab in the countryside would mark her existence had she not used charm and eloquence to reform the country. I read her husband embalmed her, and thieves stole her three times after he died. Juan held the property beside him for his later wife, Isabel. She kept Evita's remains until they buried her. A woman's worst nightmare, beauty and power exact a price. Evita rose from poverty to become an international icon for her rhetoric, personal style, and tireless work on behalf of women and the poor. A victim of uterine cancer, she lost her life to what creates life and defines a woman. It's sadly ironic. The crypt next door to hers is for sale. It's sad she lies alone, a spectacle to tourists, with a plot for lease at her side, when her commitment to husband and country were unconditional. Her consolation is an iconic persona. People revere this famous general for his slaughter of the local natives, a monument to genocide. He notes as they pass a warrior on horseback. Tamerlane stops before a broken-down crypt with glass shattered and laced cobwebs throughout. They see a dusty coffin with a top ajar. A high-pitched cry is heard from inside, and the wrought iron door opens. Liberty gasps and lurches back into Tamerlane's arms. It's a feline, not a ghost. Cats are brought to leave with their masters. They keep the rodents at bay. A tabby passes them and saunters to the next abandoned home. After internment, they require surviving family members to pay caretakers to maintain the property. If their relatives fall into hard times or lose interest, it leaves the deceased to the ravages of nature. Foreclosure in the graveyard. It's impossible to escape monetary obligations, even in death. There is no escaping capitalism if you lie with him. A dark shadow crosses overhead. The sultry scent of the aquatic permeates the air, and a shroud of black clouds threatens to flood the streets. Tamerlane turns to Liberty with a mysterious smile. His gaze lowers to her lips. Who owns your soul? She asks him. It is not for the taking. Does that mean you have not given it? It means they have not bought it. The black clouds explode in a torrential downfall. Come, let's find shelter. He takes her arm to lead her deep within the walls of the city of the dead. It is better to lie with the outlaws than the rule makers. You may end your days in an unmarked grave, but at least your soul roams free, and the sky roars with lightning and thunder. He stations her against a stone wall and whispers in her ear, Will you release yourself from the shackles of convention and give over to me completely, without remorse or regret? He asks and then draws back her hair and looks deep into her eyes. Yes, here and now. Look me in the eyes. Stay with me. Do not look away. And they make love there, in the city of the dead. They revel in being alive, to touch, feel, hear, and smell. There is no one alive to witness them. 
to hear the moans or witness skin bared in the blinding rain, only the cats and ghosts that roam the empty grounds are privy to the lustful scenario. It is an extraordinary late-night tryst, alive in the shadows of death. A delicious shock of electricity rides from thunder down spine to heart to create life amongst the dead. And for the first time in her life, Liberty is free. The next evening, Liberty visits Tamerlane's office. The colors and textures of his decor are masculine. Leather couch and chair, hardwood floors with native accent rugs, a massive carved wood desk littered with papers, books, and memorabilia. The evening light shines through arched windows with maroon velvet drapes. Dove gray walls are decorated with photographs of political rallies, prominent politicians, his framed degrees, and newspaper articles. It is wonderful to see you again, he says, and draws her into his arms. It was a spectacular night. May I offer you a glass of wine? Lovely. Have a seat. Tell me more about your causes. He carries a bottle of wine and two glasses to the table and seats himself next to her. I represent the families of the Desaparecidos, the 30,000 people who disappeared during the dirty war in the 70s, the kidnapped children of Argentina's brutal military dictatorship. For decades, the mothers and grandmothers have searched for answers about the fate of their loved ones. He offers her wine. I know a little of the history, but tell me more. In 1976, the Argentine military overthrew the government of Isabel Perón the widow of President Juan Perón. The coup was part of a larger series called Operation Condor, supported by the U.S. The military dictatorship that followed was a war against Argentinian people and include state-sponsored torture and terrorism. Anyone suspected of being aligned with leftist, socialist, or social justice cases was jailed, tortured, and often murdered. His face pales and his eyes darken. Victims were machine-gunned at edge of huge peats, thrown from airplanes into the sea, and died in detention camps. We call the desaparecidos the disappeared ones. By disappearing, the government could pretend they never existed, but their families refused to accept the fate of their children, many of whom were victims of death flights and babies born of girls raped in detention, later offered to families to adopt. I represent a great number of these families, and I'm proud to say we have identified 136 children of murdered girls who delivered in the camps. We got maternal DNA and forced compliance with suspects in the courts. Also, bodies washed ashore, identified, but thousands are still unidentified, so our mission continues. His hand grazes her thigh. That is my story, my passion, and life mission. Did you have any family members taken? Yes, I have cousins are unaccounted for. I'm sorry. Every life has a tale of injustice. It is how we handle mistreatment that creates a framework of who we are and helps shape our culture. He finishes his glass of wine. Now, my love, let's return to where we left off in the cemetery, he says, and takes her into his arms. In the following weeks, Liberty visits Tamerlane's office frequently. She helps prepare pamphlets, writes speeches, and takes calls with tips about the whereabouts of desaparecidos. One cool night, they lie in each other's arms before a fireplace stuffed with logs. I know every inch of your body, but there is a part of you that remains guarded. Please give me all of you your deepest thoughts. Liberty reflects. The truth crept up on me suddenly. One day I realized I was trapped by the society that had taught me to value freedom. Societies governed by complex laws and regulations are unlikely to be home for the free. Los Angeles is the epicenter of entertainment and media production. The business reflects a shallow, materialistic view of a populace addicted to reality shows, sports spectacles, pop stars, and fosters unflattering stereotypes. The city is where I live and work, so it's difficult to reconcile. The media's agenda is to make money off boredom and insecurity. I'm not a politician or an activist, and I can't take on the burden of the distressed and downtrodden. I have my own challenges. Buy, sell, and consume. Is that all there is to life on this planet? Sorry, I'm rambling. He sprawls out on the couch and draws her close. Please continue. I want to hear all your deepest innermost thoughts. A prominent attorney once advised me that the courts were created for attorneys to make a living and justice is only for those able to pay the price. There is some truth to it. I've spent my entire life immersed in the creative arts. 
I believe art can be a powerful means of expressing social, political, and religious discontent. Rebellion against institutions has been hidden in the subtext of art for centuries, but a true artist never reveals his ego. The great artists weave personal agendas into universal narratives. Those artists are rare, and it is not enough to cloak facts and symbolism unless your head may be end up on the block. I admire the women in white scarves who risk their lives by speaking out. Our motto is, a cruel act against one is a blow to us all. This year, for the first time in my life, I lost faith in divine destiny and pursuit of happiness. The passion I used to feel, my inspiration, dissolved. I felt chained to a production machine, at loss, how to pursue anything of value. I had succeeded in motherhood, the most difficult and worthwhile job in the world, but my life was devoid of meaning. I am sorry to hear you suffered, he says, and draws her in for a passionate kiss and freely roams the contours of her body with eager hands. His abrupt sexual intensity creates an unexpected response in Liberty. Her desire for the man is replaced by fight or flight. No, Tamerlane, I'm not finished. She abruptly disengages from him and sits upright. She looks into his eyes and addresses him like a witness on a courtroom stand. My mother named me Liberty to remind me I should never forget my rights. I am a D.A.R., a daughter of the Revolution. My ancestors fought in the Revolutionary War to secure our freedom. Yet I am denied that justice because I'm female. They can deny it, but we all know it's true. Women are subjugated, denigrated, and coerced to have sex to appease men. Men have touched me without consent my entire life. Many times I allowed it because it was easier to put up with in the short term. When I was young, I perceived it as a testament to my desirability. Perhaps I still do, but I realize now that it is all about control, appeasing a man's ego, or spreading his seed. I've been physically, psychologically, and emotionally intimidated and battered throughout my life, no more brutally than in the civil court system, ostensibly created to protect mothers and children. But in reality, it is to protect and feed wealthy men who control institutions. Women deny their authentic feelings and desires to keep a boyfriend, a boss, or husband engaged and his eyes off the bottom suckers ready to steal a financial prize. This is not a way to treat a human being. I have been a daughter, sister, wife, and mother to men. I exist. My body, my mind, and soul belong to me, and no one has the right to devalue my identity through stereotypes to alter or denigrate my intentions, values, self-worth, or touch any part of me inside or out without explicit consent. She registers his reaction. I see it in your eyes. You don't like my hidden truth. You asked for all of me, and I gave it to you. It's not pretty, but that is who I am. He's silent. No response, Mr. Rivera? I am a man who enjoys the love of a woman, and I am also driven to advance the causes of the individual. Sometimes it is difficult to untie the knots of biology and sociology. Boys will be boys. What is is your agenda here with me? To explore myself, you, and what your organization represents. That I can offer. Later, Liberty writes in her journal, Damn, it is dangerous to be truthful to a man. The next day, Liberty takes Tamerlane's advice to attend a tango lesson. She describes the experience in her journal. After the obligatory introductions, I'm assigned the worst dance partner imaginable. He's a former New Yorker, an attorney living in the San Fernando Valley, a boomer abroad. Likely the man hopes to get laid by a hot Latino. There must be some lonely woman impressed he's from California. The man is short, bald, gray fringe and stubby beard, bulging belly and a mouth the size of a blowfish, stunted hairy arms, short digits, oversized, perspiration-stained shirt, bad teeth, and nasal vocal delivery. It would be an insurmountable leap of faith to believe he is adept at the dance of love. Some cultures are better suited to dance and others better suited to mull over spreadsheets. Our dialogue is excruciatingly boring. In fact, I can't recall a single word of it. It's blanked out like the shock in the aftermath of an auto accident. Truth told, one cannot express passion if one does not possess it. He leads me across the floor like a fourth grader in dance class, with a girl much taller. As in the former example, his ineptness is transferred onto me by the stiff lead. Whomever came up with the idea of a man leading a woman was either mad or male. Worse yet, he gives me tips about how I can improve my technique. If only I would relax and follow him. Shades of Ray. 
He confesses while dragging me around that he perceives women as books. He has at least a half dozen sitting on his bedroom table. Each night he picks up one, reads a bit, then moves on to the next. He claims once he's bedded a woman book, they want to stay on his shelf and be read at least once a week. I tell him my favorites are A Devil in the White City and Stuck, a tale about a man battling his mortality. He doesn't get the irony. I go on to say I read one book at a time and devour it completely from cover to cover. But I may not read again until I'm married and have time to fully immerse myself. He stomps on my toe at the climax of our dance and searches for another book. Um, I mean, partner. The owner of the studio, a woman with flowing auburn hair, athletic figure and fitted dress, and red heels, draws me out onto the dance floor. I relax into her lead and follow with ease. And by the end of class, I am nearly a pro. And my video proves it. It cannot be denied. Whether man or woman lead, once in sync, the dance takes the couple to a higher level. Much like life, we must lead and follow in sync. There is no other way to evolve, love, or transform. The following evening, she returns to Tamerlane's office. The door is ajar, and Liberty doesn't knock. This is the time they normally meet, and she often stops by without notice. It has been a week since their last meeting. She pushes the door open and moves inside. He sits hunched over his desk, and a beautiful woman with lustrous dark hair tied into a chignon, dressed in an elegant sheath and heels, stands at his side. Hola, Perido Erdote, she asks. I'm here to visit Mr. Revere. What business do you have with my husband? Liberty is stunned. I wasn't aware. This is my wife, Celia. She has been out of the country on business. Miss Lawfer is an American visiting her son at the university. We met at a protest and she offered service as a volunteer during her stay. Liberty, it is not a good time. You can make an appointment with my secretary for later in the week. We are working on a private project. Celia is an attorney and works as my assistant on our projects. I plan to leave the country shortly so I may not have time. It was a pleasure to work with you, Mr. Rivera. My pleasure, Ms. Laufer. Have a safe journey home. Thank you. Liberty pauses and offers Tamerlane a knowing smile. She turns to his wife. Celia, I want to let you know that I had an affair with your husband. Wait, we've made love many times, but um, he's never mentioned having a wife. Sorry to be the one to unveil his deception. I hope you won't let him off the hook to seduce the next vulnerable woman at a rally. We women have to stick together, or we will join the fate of the Desaparecitos. Have a lovely day. Liberty turns and walks out the door. Back at the hotel, she writes in her journal. There is a shock in the revelation, and also relief. I feel the peace of awakening to a morning with a freshly fallen blanket of snow. The landscape ahead is pristine, untouched, ready for the weight of the first footstep, the possibility of something new. It is time to go home. And that ends episode three of novel screenplay, I Am Human. I'm Anastasia Blackwell. The novel is now available on Amazon as an ebook, along with my other projects, The House on Black Lake, A Contemporary Gothic Suspense, and The Chamber of Curiosities. A medieval fantasy, screenplays are available upon request. You can follow me on Twitter, Facebook, on AnastasiaBlackwell.com, and my project websites. Also, by subscribing to my channel, you'll be notified when my upcoming narrations of The Chamber of Curiosity and The House on Black Lake are available. This has been a B Renegade production in association with Wild Wind Studios. Music Dark Walk, courtesy of Kevin McLeod of Incompetech. Thanks again for listening.